Father Mark signing on, continuing the course on the history of Catholicism in the United States, uh, continuing with the decade of the 1870s. After the Civil War, the increasing population of the United States required establishment of uh, new dioceses to service the, uh, the, the immigrants because so many of them are, uh, were Catholic for reasons we've already covered. In the uh, decade, this decade, between 1872 and 1880, seven new dioceses were established. One of those was the Diocese of Peoria, Illinois, the separation of which from the territory of Chicago occurred at the same time as the new provinces of Milwaukee and Santa Fe were created. Excuse me. And we'll visit Milwaukee uh, in due course. The first bishop of Peoria, Illinois, was John Lancaster Spaulding. He was a nephew of the, by this point, deceased Archbishop of Baltimore, Martin Spaulding. And we will have occasion to uh, encounter John Spaulding uh, in due course. So his background, he was born in Kentucky, educated at the American College in Louvain, Belgium, ordained a priest for the Diocese of Louisville, Kentucky. Like his uncle, uh, the Archbishop Martin, uh, John Lancaster Spaulding, was an inopportunist with regard to papal infallibility, but eventually submitted uh, for reasons of obedience without offering any strong articulation by way of support of the doctrine. Just, well, okay, this is what the council decided, so I, I acquiesce. Another priest considered for Peoria, but passed over and later became a bishop elsewhere, was John Ireland, uh, born in Ireland. Uh, the family moved to Minnesota uh, when they were young, so he you know, discerned an ecclesiastical vocation in Minnesota. Uh, his bishop was a French immigrant priest who sent his, his seminarians back to France for, for training. Uh, so John Ireland, he was born in Ireland, went to Minnesota, but went back to Europe, went to France for a seminary, was ordained for his home, for his diocese in Minnesota, so then went, uh, went back. As a priest, uh, he served as a chaplain in the Union Army uh, during the Civil War. His name was withdrawn from consideration for Peoria and instead, he was appointed coadjutor, Bishop of St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, he was co uh, coadjutor to the bishop who had sent him to study in France, and then when that bishop uh, passed away, he uh, coadjutor is an auxiliary who's an automatic successor. Uh, so uh, Ireland became bishop of St. Paul, Minnesota, on the 31st of July, 1884. He became a leader among the Americanist prelates, favoring rapid assimilation of immigrants using the English language, a strong public cooperation with the civic establishment, lauding the U.S. separation of church and state as the ideal ecclesiology for the modern world. <clears throat> and Americanism, of course, would be condemned uh, during his lifetime for reasons that we will uh, cover. <clears throat> but the America, as we saw, the even though Isaac, Father Isaac Hecker is considered the father of Americanism in the form that it was eventually condemned in 1899, it was um, 
uh, it had roots all the way back in the Maryland Catholicism, the accommodationist Anglo-American accom- uh, Catholicism in Maryland, which in turn was rooted in the the, the English anti-popery laws. So, anyway, but uh, so but confining ourselves for now to the decade of the 1870s, the year 1872, uh, we meet a for the second time although the first time was just briefly so. Uh, we meet a father, Edward McGlynn, M-C-G-L-Y-N-N. Born 1837 in New York, although both of his parents were Irish immigrants that came from Donegal. The father's name was Peter, mother's name was Sarah. Uh, his father came to the United States for the reasons that, that that literally millions of other Irish did that they were they were completely disenfranchised in their own country because of the English occupation. <clears throat> so came here seeking both religious freedom as well as economic opportunity. His father Peter became a contractor, did very well, acquired a small fortune uh, before dying in 1847. Uh, they had uh, ten children. McGlynn, Edward McGlynn, the, the priest we're talking about, was one of ten children. When McGlynn was age 13, Dagger John, Archbishop John Hughes of New York, who was a family friend, uh, as well as uh, the, the pastor of the parish where the McGlynns live, was uh, Father Jeremiah Cummings, arranged for him to attend seminary at the Urban College in Rome, the the College of the Propagation of the Faith. In 1859, he transferred to, when, when the, the North American College was open in Rome, he transferred there. He received a doctorate in theology and philosophy, ordained a priest on March 24, 1860, in the Church of St. John Lateran, the Cathedral of the Pope, in his capacity as Bishop of Rome, and then returned home for service in New York. Uh, later in his life, I think we'll get to it in the next decade, he was actually excommunicated and uh, removed from office from 1887 until 1892 on charges of disobedience and suspicion of socialist leanings. And as we covered earlier in the 19th century, socialism in, in their context uh, always meant uh, atheism, or at least anti anti Catholicism. So, but that's in the next decade. We meet him here in 1872. He was, uh, well, because of the canon law problem we talked about, he was actually rector of St. Stephen's Church in New York City, although functionally in this period that meant pastor. In 1872, he spoke in favor publicly, he spoke in his, in his sermons and, uh, and, and wrote opinion pieces in the newspapers, speaking in favor of public school, arguing that the, their, their neutral, or at least allegedly religiously neutral character presented no danger to children of the Catholic faith. So this, of course, got, I mean, we know the history of the school issues. You know, New York was one of the places that had a Bible war two, actually two Bible Wars, earlier in the century. So the newspapers just, you know, they, 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 they went wild with this, and uh, this revived the school issue that had been waged prior to the Civil War in New York and had already been revived, at, as we saw in the Bible War in Cincinnati in this very decade. The reason he spoke is that Cincinnati Bible War was actually still going on. Recall that it began in 1869, but it was working its way through the courts. And uh, it wasn't resolved till 1873 by the Ohio Supreme Court. But in 1872, there had been a ruling of a lower court. And so he, you know, he spoke about that. Now, uh, why? Why would he do this? Um, especially with his, even though he was born in the United States, his parents are from Ireland, so he certainly would have grown up hearing, you know, the stories of... Um, the religious disabilities imposed on the Irish in their own country by the anti-popery laws. The difference with McGlynn and other post-Civil War American clergy 
including bishops, um, was that uh, people like McGlynn and Americanist bishops like John Ireland, who had, ser- they had served in the Union Army as chaplains, so they were amenable to growing federalism. So they, they saw a stronger federal government as a positive good because from their perspective it, it ended slavery and there was no other you know, conceivable way that they could saw that slavery could have been eliminated other than by a strong central government. They thought, well, okay, if it accomplished that good, maybe a strong central government can accomplish other goods, uh, including education. And so they were predisposed to see a strong central government, a strong federal government as beneficial rather than like a like like Dagger John, you know, and other earlier prelates we covered in the nineteenth century, to see it as detrimental, to see to see a strong government in any form as detrimental to the potentially detrimental to the faith because of their experience in, in Ireland. In eighteen seventy three, the next year, the Ohio Supreme Court ended the Cincinnati Bible War, uh, as we covered, I read an excerpt in an earlier video, ruling against teaching any religion in any public school in the state of Ohio, or even any religious, uh, or as I said, sectarian practices, even singing hymns, even or, or, or even saying the Our Father. Another priest in New York not, not McGlynn, but another priest in New York thought he formulated a solution to this school's problem. His name is Father Patrick McSweeney. Uh, he, he was a priest of the Archdiocese of New York, and he made a, a deal, a handshake deal, with the public school board in Poughkeepsie, New York. And it was approved by his archbishop, uh, Archbishop John McCluskey, uh, who ended up becoming Cardinal, John Mc- the first American Cardinal. The deal was as follows. First, the public school board would lease Catholic school buildings for use as public schools. Second, during regular school hours, only approved public school courses would be taught using approved textbooks reading, writing, arithmetic, essentially. Third, the public school board would pay the salaries of the teachers. Even though in this case, in the Poughkeepsie experiment, those teachers were nuns. Still, the public school board would pay them. But the nuns would confine themselves to secular school subjects during school hours. Fourth, after school, the buildings would remain open for use in religious instruction so that all children who attended public school would receive religious instruction from their own, you know, either the ministers for the Protestants or uh, the nuns for the Catholics, but but that religious instruction would not be paid for by the government or really by the tax money, public, you know, public tax money. Fifth, non-Catholic ministers would be welcome on campus during this after-school religious time to teach religion uh, to the children of their own denomination, and they were free to use the King James Bible for their students. But no religious books, including the Bible, would be purchased with state money. The families had to had to, you know, buy those, or, or the churches, you know, just come up with a way, you know, to, to fund that. And uh, so McSweeney and the board and the local Protestant ministers in Poughkeepsie felt this was a compromise they could all live with to ensure religious instruction while maintaining separation of church and state and avoiding interreligious bickering that had triggered the Cincinnati Bible War in 1869. This Poughkeepsie experiment endured for 17 years, 1873 to 1890. But it was, it was a handshake deal, and it only ended when Ireland, John Ireland, who by that point was an archbishop, 
you know, made an issue of it and everybody found out and then people got mad and, you know, so then that ended it. But we'll see that later in the, in the century. <clears throat> oh, okay. In 1874, a uh, a case. Oh no! What did I, I must skip something? In a, in 1874, on April 14th, a newspaper, the Buffalo Commercial Advertiser, published an account of a Protestant minister who participated in this arrangement, the Poughkeepsie arrangement and quoted that quoted him as saying his only reservation being the presence of Catholic images in some of the classrooms. As a result, they were removed. The nuns removed the crosses and the statues from the classrooms during school hours and then would bring them back out, you know, after school for the religion class. In June of 1874, another uh, newspaper, the New York Tablet, wrote a favorable editorial about this arrangement. This led uh, to James McMaster uh, to denounce it. And he was an ultramontane, uh, meaning extremely conservative, pro-papal. He was the editor of the New York Freeman's Journal, another newspaper, but this one was Catholic. So uh, this guy, uh, McMaster, was a... Um, uh, born in Scotland, uh, Protestant, came to the United States, converted to Catholicism, uh, was accepted into the church by Dagger John, Archbishop John Hughes of New York. And in 1848, uh, he, uh, he purchased the newspaper, the New York Freeman's Journal, from the then Bishop John Hughes and uh, became, a, you know, that, that's how he made his living. He was a states' rights Democrat. Uh, and during the Civil War, you may have come across his name in other contexts because during the Civil War, uh, as a states' rights Democrat, but in the North, uh, he was very critical in his, in his newspaper of Lincoln, uh, such that, you know, since, since Lincoln suspended habeas corpus during the war, McMaster was arrested and, and incarcerated for thought crime or, or word crime, you know, writing, just writing criticisms. <clears throat> anyway, with the with a Poughkeepsie situation, he, he denounced it uh, because in his reading, it yielded religious priority to the secular sentiment of non-Catholics. McSweeney's brother... Edward, Father Edward McSweeney, he was also a priest in New York, he replied with an editorial in the tablet, in the New York tablet, that his brother would have preferred Catholic schools, but could see no reason to decline a situation that was beneficial to everyone and had the potential to neutralize, create a model to neutralize what had been so many conflicts since the 1830s. McMaster collected all the newspaper stories, all the editorials about this, and forwarded them to a lady named Ella Eads, E-D-E-S. Ella Eads was another convert like McMaster, uh, she was, but she was born in the United States. She was uh, born in New England um, in 1832. Uh, she was uh, baptized, converted, was baptized Catholic in 1852. Around 1866, she took a permanent residence in Rome. She was a member of an old, you know, New England family that had money, so she didn't actually have to work for a living. This was, you know, but she was educated and, and you know, was liked to write and was kind of, a, you know, interested in things and, and knew a lot of people. Uh, in Rome, she uh, she worked for a time for Cardinal Alessandro Barnabo, the prefect of the Propaganda Fide. After 1870, she became a de facto Roman correspondent for many newspapers, 
since she lived there and she knew everybody, uh, you know, she started writing articles and, and, uh, I don't think she used the word then, but it would be syndicated, you know, syndicated the articles that other and other newspapers picked him up, including the London Tablet, the New York Herald, the New York World, although for that, for the New York World, she wrote under a pen name, Ann Brewster, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, the New York Freeman's Journal, McMaster's paper, the Catholic Register, the Catholic Review, the Catholic News. All of them, you know, paid, you know, uh, what we would call today syndication fees to publish her uh, her articles. Her interest was in Roman ecclesiastical event, events, and as such, uh, she was uh, um, an ultramontane like McMaster, extreme conservative, <clears throat> loyal to the Pope. Um and she was uh, essentially an, a, 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 a spy, well, a spy, maybe too dramatic. I mean, it wasn't actually espionage, but a source. That's probably a better way to She was a, a source of information for ultramontane conservative clerics back in the United States, including Dagger John uh, and uh, a later Archbishop of New York, uh, Corrigan. Uh, and and so she's a, and she had contact. So anyway, I McMaster forwarded all of this to her, knowing that she would be able to forward it to the right person in Rome to, as McMaster hoped, condemn the Poughkeepsie experiment. <clears throat> so she translated all of this, all the things that McMaster sent her, translated them into Italian, in which she was fluent, because no one in, you know, no one in the Vatican was, would, would stoop to read anything in English. Uh, so once she translated them, they were forwarded to the Holy Office, and on November 24th, 1875, the Holy Office, which is now the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, issued an instruction published that year, 1875, in which it, it wrote about the dangers of public schools and urged that Catholic schools be built where none existed and that existing schools be expanded. Once a Catholic school existed, according to this instruction, Catholic parents were obliged to send their children to Catholic schools, Catholic schools, unless they provided sufficient reason to their bishop under penalty of sin. Children in public schools, the instruction went on, uh, should be given instruction, catechism instruction. But the November 24 statement did not provide clarity with regard to absolution of parents. So if parents, Catholic parents did not send their children to an available Catholic school, they were in a state of sin according to this instruction. But then how was a priest, you know, could, could a priest in confession only absolve them if they, if they did, if they changed and sent their children to Catholic school? Or if, if they went to confession, confessed it, th that they were not sending their children to Catholic school, and also that they did not intend to send their children to Catholic school, was a priest free to absolve them? You know, or does the fact that, that they, they stated, they admitted up front, that they were going to, uh, to, to perpetuate their noncompliance, you know, their, their sin, as the instruction defined it, does that does that mean that they did not have a firm purpose of amendment? You know, so that that would make the confession a fraud. The American hierarchy, the American bishops, uh, completely ignored this instruction until the Holy See ordered that the issue of public of schools, the school issue, be placed on the agenda of the Third Plenary Council of Baltimore in 1884, which we'll cover in the next decade. The uh, case against uh, McGlynn, Father McGlynn, who had spoken publicly in favor of public schools in New York, uh, that case was also sent to Rome by McMaster. So, you know, McMaster reported him to Ella Eads, uh, sent the statements to him in English. She translated them and then, you know, put him up the, uh, you know, sent him up the, uh, uh, the, the curia. 
McMaster uh, it condemned, among his many objections to public schools, uh, was he condemned the moral standards of public schools as intrinsically degenerate because they did not teach the gospel and questioned whether sacramental absolution could be granted to Catholic parents who, who sent their children to public schools when a Catholic parochial school was available. So Cardinal Franchi, uh, F-R-A-N-C-H-I, an Italian in, in the Curia, in the uh, propagation of the faith, no, uh, Franchi was, uh, was the Holy Office. He, he wrote a letter to the bishop separate from the instruction. The letter's dated the same year, uh, April 10, 1874. The American archbishops discussed the matter when they met in Cincinnati that same year. They replied to Cardinal Franchi that public schools in the United States were officially non-sectarian, which they claimed was not intrinsically inimical to Catholicism. So this tells us that by 1874, I mean, unless they were lying, I mean, that at least the, the, the generality of public schools had followed the Cincinnati model and just gone for strict neutrality, that there would be no, no Bible reading, no, no Lord's Prayer, no hymn singing, not, not, nothing in, in public schools. So that this letter, this exchange of letters allows us to date that phenomenon. Uh, so by 1874. Uh, therefore, based on that revel on that fact, the American archbishops told the cardinal, the curia, uh, that denial of absolution to parents whose children attended public schools would cause more harm than good. You know that that like that they, they said that okay if we if if they come to confession and tell us this and we deny them absolution, there's virtually zero possibility that that will make them pull their children out of Catholic, uh, of public school and send them to Catholic school. More likely, they'll just never come to church again at all. Anyway, we're going to encounter this issue again. <clears throat> the following year, 1875, the United States uh, received its first cardinal, first American cardinal, John McCluskey, Archbishop of New York. Uh, March fifth, uh, March fifteenth, eighteen seventy-five, was appointed as first cardinal, and he actually received his red hat on April twenty-seventh, uh, the next month, uh, eighteen seventy-five. John McCluskey, born March tenth, eighteen ten, in Brooklyn, New York. But uh, both of his parents were born in Ireland. So the you know the, so we're the next generation of that. There they were potato famine refugees and so now the, you know that generation's having children. Um they they were from uh, uh yeah both, both parents uh, Patrick and Elizabeth were from Ireland. He John was baptized by uh the Reverend Benedict Joseph Fenwick, a Jesuit in uh, uh on May 6th, 1810 at St. Peter's Church in Manhattan. McCluskey entered Mount St. Mary's College in Emmitsburg, Maryland in September 1821, which we, we visited there uh, earlier in the course. On January 12, 1834, McCluskey was ordained a priest for the Diocese of New York by Bishop Dubois, whom we've also met. He was ordained in St. Patrick's Old Cathedral making John McCluskey the first native New Yorker, meaning the first, the first person born in New York City, to enter the diocesan priesthood and be ordained in New York City for the diocesan priesthood for that diocese. Now, there were other guys born in New York who went into religious orders, but he was the first one uh, born in New York who ordained in New York for the diocese of New York. I uh, served as first assignment parochial vicar at St. Patrick's at the cathedral and seminarians because, you know, priests never have one job. So he was simultaneously appointed chaplain to Bellevue Hospital. Bishop Dubois uh, then sent him for, for uh, advanced studies to the Gregorian University in Rome. He was there from 1834 to 1837, then returned to New York uh, where he was uh, 
uh, appointed a pastor of St. Joseph's Church in Greenwich Village, serving there from August of 1837 to March of 1844. But, you know, it was never just one job. So in addition to his duties at St. Joseph's, full-time pastor, he was also assigned as the first president of St. John's College in Fordham from 1841 on. On November 21st, 1843, McCluskey was appointed coadjutor, Bishop of New York, and uh, which means automatic successor for which purpose he was ordained as a titular bishop by Pope Gregory the Sixteenth. He received his uh, consecration on his 34th birthday. He was ordained a bishop on his 34th birthday. Uh, present were uh, Dagger John, uh, Bishop John Hughes, as well as Bishop Benedict Fenwick, the guy who had baptized him back when Fenwick was a just a, a priest, but now was a bishop. And all this took place in uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. McCluskey busied himself uh, primarily with visit, visitation of the entire diocese and was also instrumental uh, in the conversion of Isaac Hecker in 1844, uh, who later became the founder of the Paulist, as we said, and also the conversion of another uh, Protestant uh, who who also entered into ecclesiastical life, James Roosevelt Bailey, who ended up uh, later becoming Archbishop of Baltimore. McCluskey was named uh, the founding bishop of the of the new diocese of Albany, New York, by Pope Pius IX on May twenty first, eighteen forty seven. Albany is, of course, the capital of New York uh, uh, State and it was carved out of the Diocese of New York. He was formally installed by Dagger John the following September 19th. At the time of his arrival, his new diocese covering all of upstate New York uh, encompassed 30,000 square miles, containing 60,000 Catholics, 25 church, served by 25 churches, 34 priests, two orphanages, and two schools, two Catholic schools. He increased the number of parishes from 25 to 113 and increased the number of priests from 34 to 84. He established three additional schools for boys, another, another one for girls, four more orphanages, an additional 15 parochial schools and a seminary, St. Joseph's Provincial Seminary in uh, Troy, New York. He also persuaded uh, numerous religious orders to come to the Diocese of Albany, the Augustinians, the Jesuits, the Franciscans, the Capuchins, uh, the, the religious of the Sacred Heart, the ladies of the Sacred Heart, Sisters of Charity, Sisters of Mercy, Sisters of St. Joseph, and the Christian Brothers. Following the death of Dagger John, Archbishop John Hughes of New York, in January of 1864, Bishop McCluskey was transferred and appointed the second Archbishop of New York on May 6, 1864, and installed August 27th of the same year. In that capacity, two years later, 1866, he attended the Second Plenary Council of Baltimore, where he preached the opening sermon. Uh, McCluskey also was one of those uh, we uh, alluded to earlier in the uh, when the decade began that uh, uh, attended the First Vatican Council, 1869-1870. But he voted in favor of papal infallibility. He actually went on record voting in favor of it. He wasn't one of those, you know, that stayed home uh, to avoid voting. Or like the like the Little Rock guy voted against it. McCluskey was created Cardinal Priest of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva by Pius the Ninth in the consistory of March fifteenth, eighteen seventy five, thereby becoming the first American cardinal. This choice inadvertently 
at least on the part of the Pope. I mean, he had no idea what what this would trigger, but it it fueled antagonisms, pre-existing antagonisms in the American hierarchy, because it was a snub to Baltimore. Baltimore was the first diocese in the Republic, and this choice passed over Archbishop Martin Spalding, who was the uh, the the Archbishop of Baltimore, and it passed. And Spalding died, uh, you know, in that in that time period. And so it also passed over his successor, James Roosevelt Bailey, uh, as Archbishop of Baltimore. There were also other archbishops who were senior in terms of holy orders, uh, even though their dioceses were newer. So they were also passed over. Uh, Purcell of Cincinnati, whom we met, Peter Kenrick of St. Louis. Uh, although Kenrick, Peter would he would because of the his performance about the infallibility uh, that was suspect. So why New York and not Baltimore? And remember, at this period, the Diocese of Baltimore included the capital, Washington D.C. That now that's a separate archdiocese, but at this time it was part of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. So why New York instead of that? At the time, New York was uh, had had reached the point it was the largest American city in terms of population. It was already an international port uh, with a, a growing immigrant population from Catholic countries, and many stayed there. I mean, there, there were many others who came to New York, but then went somewhere else in the country. But there were there were many who stayed in New York. Uh, McCluskey's elevation coincided with another expansion of the hierarchy, the creation of four, four new metropolitan provinces, meaning four new archdioceses in 1875. Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Boston, and Santa Fe. Since the United States had not yet established formal diplomatic relations with the Holy See, a papal ablegate was sent, uh, Monsignor uh, Cesare Ronsetti. As part of his mission, he, uh, he gave the pallium to Archbishop John Williams of Boston on May 2nd to Archbishop John Martin Henney of Milwaukee on June 3rd. Archbishop Frederick Wood of Philadelphia on June 17th. So that left only Santa Fe. Well, the good Monsignor Ronsetti did not wish to travel all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico. So he entrusted the pallium to Salpont, who was the apostolic vicar of Arizona, uh, entrusted it to him to deliver to Lamy, the Archbishop of Santa Fe, whom we've already met. Same year, 1875, the first African-American bishop in the United States was ordained, James Augustine Healy, H-E-A-L-Y. James was born in Georgia to a mixed-race family. His uh, mother was a slave. His father was an Irish immigrant. Uh, James was born on April 6th, 1830. So, you know, slavery was still very much alive. However, because of his mixed race, he identified with and was publicly accepted as a white Irish American. As he was half Irish and and as one account indicates that his his mother uh, was mixed race herself. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's how he got ordained. He was ordained in 1854. His mixed race ancestry was not widely known. In fact, it wasn't known at all, apart from his mentors uh, in the Catholic Church. So that's why, you know, seminarians, if you look it up, you know, who was the first African American priest in the United States, the, it'll, they'll generally say it was Augustus Tolton, who was a former slave. And so it was certainly known, you know, for all of his life to be black. And he was ordained in 1886. 
So he's sometimes credited as being the first black Catholic priest in the United States, even though Healy was ordained decades earlier in 1854. But Healy was not universally known to be black. He passed, as they would, you know, as they would say, passed as white. Anyway, uh, uh, James was the eldest of ten children. They were born near Macon, Georgia. His father's name was Michael. His mother's name was Eliza. <clears throat> uh, uh, he, his father, Michael, uh, and emigrated from Roscommon, Ireland, in 1818, and did very well for himself in the plantation business eventually acquired a 1,600-acre plantation in uh, Jones County, Georgia, uh, across, the, across the river from uh, the town of Macon. He eventually owned, it wasn't always the same number, but during his life he owned between 49 and 60 slaves, and this was a cotton plantation. Among them was this young slave woman, uh, Eliza, whom he took as his I suppose the, the polite way to say it was his common law wife uh, because interracial marriage was, uh, was not legal in the South. In fact, it would not be legal until 1969. <clears throat> um, most of their children, the ones who survived to adulthood, uh, did pretty well in life, and they were helped by Healy's financial success and by a key decision he made is that uh, they would all, even though they, you know, some more than others, but they could pass as white, uh, so they would know the children were never enslaved. Uh, but he did send them to the north for their educations. Uh, in this case, uh, James, the one we're talking about, as well as Hugh and Patrick, uh, sent them to Quaker schools in the north, in uh, uh, Flushing, New York, and Burlington, New Jersey. Later, each of those attended the newly opened College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. James graduated valedictorian of the first class of, of uh, Holy Cross College in 1849. A, a younger, brothers, uh, younger brother uh, named Sherwood began uh, at Holy Cross in 1844. Another younger brother, uh, Michael, 1849. Following graduation, James wished to enter the priesthood. He could not study at the Jesuit novitiate because that was in Maryland, and Maryland was a slave state. So with the help of John Bernard Fitzpatrick, James Healy entered the, a Sulpician seminary in Montreal, Canada. In 1852, he transferred uh, to study. He went to Paris, uh, and studied at, at the founding Sulpician Seminary, Saint Sulpice, in Paris. Uh, he worked for a, a, toward a doctorate, to, envisioning that he would just be a, a, a career, a scholar priest. But at some point there, uh, he changed his mind, and he decided he wanted to be a, a, a parish priest, which was a much more complicated proposition in, in his case, given his mixed birth. On June 10, 1854, he was ordained at the Cathedral of Paris, Notre Dame Cathedral, but ordained as a priest to serve in the Diocese of Boston, Massachusetts. So he was the first African-American, depending on, I mean, I know race is an issue now, and I, so I'm not going to get into all that, but, you know, I've already told you his racial background, so depending on how you classify it, you can either consider him to be the first African-American ordained for the service in the United States, or another interpretation, it would be Augustus Tolton. I'll leave that to you. <clears throat> I'll just say that at the time, he identified with as a, as a white Irish Catholic. When Healy returned to the United States, he became uh, what we say today as a parochial vicar in Boston. Uh, he served the archbishop uh, who helped establish a... Uh, uh, you know, his standing in the church. In 1866, Healy was appointed pastor of St. James, which at the time was a, a very large, active parish in Boston. In 1874, the Boston legislature, as part of another move of, you know, inspired by the Kulterkampf, and we'll see more of these, uh, 
was considering taxing the church, taxing the Catholic Church, um, arguing that because you know, unlike the Lutheran Church or Methodist or whatever, that 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 the because the Catholic Church had a king, that the that the Pope was the monarch of of the church, that it would that it was actually that the Catholic Church was not was not a church, that it was it was actually a political institution, and therefore it should be subject to taxation. So in the course of all that, those arguments, uh, Healy defended stoutly defended uh, in, in both public speaking as well as in writing and articles and pamphlets, uh, defended uh, Catholic institutions as vital organizations that helped society and helped the common good socially and financially. Uh, and he succeeded. That that idea of, of direct taxation of the churches in Boston and it, it didn't um, it you know it didn't it didn't it didn't work. But the idea would recur and it still is recurring. Uh, and eventually they'll get their way. You know, that's just, that's just what's going to happen. His success in the public sphere uh, brought him to the attention of the, the wider uh, church. So he was appointed by Pope Pius IX to the, be the uh, second bishop of Portland, Portland, Maine. Not Portland, Oregon. Portland, Maine. He was consecrated bishop of Portland on June 2nd, 1875 becoming, again, given all the givens that I've already discussed with regard to his, uh, his ethnic background, uh, could be considered the first African-American ordained a Catholic bishop in the United States. For the next 25 years, he governed uh, his diocese, uh, supervising also uh, the hiving off of the diocese of territory from his diocese, which became the diocese of Manchester, New Hampshire, in 1885. During his time in Maine, uh, that was an, it was a period of extensive immigration from Catholic countries. So he established 60 new churches, 68 missions, 18 convents, and 18 parochial schools. During that period. Um, uh, he also uh, the missions part of not all the 68 missions but many of the missions were serving um, the Abenaki and the French Canadian the well not Canadians but the the French uh, French Acadians you know some of them who fled came to Louisiana but others just went across the border to Maine and and many were still spoke French uh, so he he ensured that they had missions uh, where they had priests who spoke those languages. And he himself was uh, fluent in French because he, you know, studied at a French seminary. Uh, Healy uh, was also the the only member that I can find that uh, of the American Catholic hierarchy to excommunicate Catholics who joined the Knights of Labor, which was a, a labor union, <clears throat> because he assumed that it was a front, a communist front. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the Knights of Labor later. Two months before his death, uh, he was called uh, to Rome by Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He was granted a uh, an honor an honorary position, assistant to the papal throne, uh, which is you know it's it's it, it's an honor an honor you know it, it, it's a recognition. Uh, but then he he died uh, died two years later. Uh, excuse me, two months later. Okay, eighteen seventy five. One of the reasons I spent so much time on the Kulterkampf in an earlier video in, in Germany uh, was because of this. Now, I alluded to this uh, a minute ago with uh, Boston. In that case, it was just the city council. The Boston City Council was um, torn with the idea of taxing, you know, taxing the church directly. But that, that, that also, that, that was not confined to, to Boston. Um, which brings us to the Blaine Amendment. B L A I N E, eighteen seventy five, the same year, same year that McCluskey became cardinal, the same year that Healy was uh, uh, became uh, became bishop. The emotion generated by the Cincinnati Bible War in eighteen sixty nine did not disappear with the Ohio State Supreme Court ruling in eighteen seventy three. The conflict provoked pamphlets, debates, books, newspaper articles defending all sides. 
So only two years later, 1875, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives was a guy named James G. Blaine, B-L-A-I-N-E. He lived from 1830 to 1898, excuse me, 1830 to 1893. He served as Speaker, 31st Speaker of the House from 1869 to 1875. Senator for the state of Maine, 1876 to 1881. And Secretary of State, the U.S. Secretary of State, 1889 to 1892. But we meet him now in 1875 uh, in his capacity as 31st Speaker of the House. He proposed an amendment to the U.S. Constitution called the Blaine Amendment, which would prohibit the use of any government money for any religious instruction at all. Essentially taking the ruling of the Ohio Supreme Court in the Bible War case and, and making it a constitutional amendment. It passed the House. This amendment passed the House, but it failed to get the necessary votes in the Senate. So some details. Uh, it was proposed on December 14th, 1875, in reaction to efforts by religious groups, uh, including the Catholic Church, but not only, as there were also Protestant groups. As, as you remember, the whole public school movement started because of Protestant ministers in the 1830s as part of that whole, you know, the Unitarian movement in New England. Uh, but the Catholic Church, you know, they they were they, they like like Dagger John in New York was arguing that you know he didn't want to pay a double tax. So if we're going to have schools, then then Catholics should not pay taxes for the public school. That that money that they should just pay for the for the parochial schools. The president was Ulysses S. Grant. He suggested in his final annual address to Congress, the State of the Union address in December of 1875, that an amendment be proposed to the Constitution, quote, making it the duty of each of the several states to establish and forever maintain free public schools adequate to the education of all the children and prohibiting the granting of any school funds or school taxes for the benefit of or in aid of any religious sect, S-E-C-T, or denomination, end quote. It's no coincidence that Grant was from Ohio, so he had followed those events, he knew those events in the Cincinnati Bible War and what the Cincinnati Supreme Court had ruled on this issue. So he wants to, he just wanted even farther to, to not only, uh, you know, have, have the Ohio reasoning instantiated in the Constitution, but also to mandate public schools in the Constitution. So Blaine's Amendment, uh, the text of it read, quote, No state shall make any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's just the First Amendment. But it adds, And no money raised by taxation in any state for the support of public schools or derived from any public fund thereof, nor any public lands devoted thereto, shall ever be under the control of any religious sect, nor shall any money so raised or lands so devoted be divided between religious sects or denominations. Uh, so this uh, amendment, uh, that text is found in the uh, Congressional Record of the 44th Congress, first session, dated December 14th, 1875. August 4th, 1876, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the amendment with 180 votes in favor, only seven against. The amendment, uh, however, did not receive the necessary two-thirds vote in the Senate. Only 28 senators voted in favor, 
16 voted against. Nevertheless, the language and the content of, Bl of the Blaine Amendment were incorporated over the ensuing decades into many state constitutions, especially in the West, after Congress made it a precondition for admission into the Union in 1876, the centennial year. Eventually, 37 states came to have such Blaine amendments in their constitutions, forbidding public funds from being used for religious schools. These amendments have been cited repeatedly in opposition to school vouchers on the grounds that public funds cannot be used to pay for education in religious schools under any such Blaine amendments. And so it goes. In addition, to intimidate Catholic bishops into silence, Blaine proposed, not an amendment, but just proposed as for a matter of law, that church property be subject to taxation equal to any comparably sized business. This would not be detrimental to Protestant congregations, which typically only had one building, so if they had to pay tax on one building, they could. But this would be crippling to Catholic dioceses, which had vast numbers of churches, convents, monasteries, schools, rectories, hospitals. Dagger John was dead, and there were no bishops at the time with his aggressive nature to focus a national Catholic response. The threat of taxing church property has so far not been carried out but it has remained an effective weapon to quarantine the Catholic voice in public discourse. Regarding education, eventually all but 11 state governments have uh, such Blaine amendments in their constitutions, even if they call it something else. And the other states have accomplished the same thing through statute rather than amending their constitution. Ironically, beginning in the 1990s. The school voucher movement restarted this whole issue, but in this cycle, Protestants and Catholics allied together to have such Blaine Amendment provisions overturned, You know, recognizing that it, it, it harms both. Okay, uh, the next year, 1876, was the centennial of the United States. You know, it counted from the Declaration of Independence, uh, rather than the federal constitution, uh, which was later. Uh, well, let me see how long we've been going. Well, almost. All right. A lot of things happen in the centennial year, so uh, we've been going almost an hour. So I'll stop here, and uh, we'll pick up with the centennial in the uh, in the next video. So for now, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.